Hey guys, Chris here with The Good Old Gamer. So today is IPC test number five. And today we're gonna to be taking a look at the Intel Core series, the first generation Intel Core series. Now I know it's a little confusing. You have Core 2 and now you go back to Core 1. But the Core series is what we're still currently using except now we're looking at the ninth generation. So today we're gonna to take a look at where it all started and how good was it really compared to all of the other offerings that came before it. So if you're interested, stick around and check it out. Taking a quick look at Anantex Intel Core i7 870 and i5 750 Linfield review, harder, better, faster, stronger. So you can tell by the title that they were pretty impressed with this processor back in September 2009. I just want to touch on a couple of quick little bits here because a lot of people will probably be saying, hey, why aren't we testing Bloomfield? First off, for these IPC tests, we're sticking with mainstream processors. So anything that does not meet the mainstream processor criteria, we're not going to be taking a look at, which Bloomfield was an HEDT and was actually the first HEDT lineup. Also, interestingly enough, I mean, it's the same process and the same core architecture underneath, but there are a few little differences. First off, you can see on the die size, Bloomfield was only 263 millimeters squared, whereas Linfield is 296 millimeters squared. And this translates into 731 million transistors up to 774 million transistors. And this is quickly explained why. Despite being cheaper, Linfield is larger than Bloomfield. That does not happen very often in the tech industry. The larger die is due to one major addition, an on-die PCIe controller. So this is something that started with the Linfield processors and of course is still being done today. Now skipping on over to the final words, there are a few bits in here that I found particularly interesting. In this paragraph right here, they're talking about how turbo speed, which was introduced in Linfield, was one of the major things that they really liked about the CPUs. But it's this paragraph here that I found really interesting. Perhaps that's what's kept me from falling in love with Bloomfield right away. It was fast, but in the same way that its predecessors were fast. If you didn't have a well-threaded application, Bloomfield wasn't any better than a similarly clocked Penryn. And that right there is really striking because if you've been watching the IPC series, you've noticed that Anantech up until this point has correctly identified the IPC speeds of CPUs up until this point. And what they're saying is according to them, a similarly clocked Penryn should match the core first generation. Now, that's really interesting and really something that I want to see here today. Linfield shows us the beginning of how all microprocessors are going to be made in the future. Even AMD is embracing Turbo, and we will see it in Fusion in 2011. So that was very correct. Obviously, we know for a fact that Turbo speeds on processors, both AMD, Intel, that has come to fruition. Now, taking a look at the processor we're going to be using here today, and the reason why I want to go ahead and explain this is because to save money, I went ahead and went with an Intel Xeon X3470 instead of the Core i7-870, and there's a pretty good reason for this. These guys are selling for about $50 or $60. I got this for about $30, and guess what? They're the exact same CPU, but I'm going to point that out to you guys right here, right now. One was designed for server, one was desktop, they're both discontinued, both 45 nanometer, both similarly priced, both 4 core 8 thread, both 2.93 gigahertz, turbo speed up to 3.6 gigahertz, both have 8 megabytes of cache, both have the same bus speed, both have the same TDP, both have the same voltage. The Xeon does support more memory, but that's not really a big deal, and it supports slower RAM, also not a big deal. But same memory channel, same memory speed, same everything, same, 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 same. So I just wanted to point that out to you guys that I'm not trying to cheat here. I was just going for a more budget-friendly route to do these testings. So that is the CPU that we are doing here today. Now, of course, I turned off turbo because that's going to throw things off. And we overclocked this just like we did with the X6800 up to 2.97 gigahertz. Now, as for memory, we are now using DDR3. So this means we're changing things up here a little bit from our previous IPC tests. 
So what I did is I used DDR3 2133 megahertz memory at CAS9, underclocked it to 1600 megahertz, and set the timings to 88824. This is exactly twice the latency of the DDR2 that we used and twice the memory speed. So this is the only way that I could balance these out to where it's at least somewhat even across the board. Now on to the benchmarks. So starting off with Cinebench R15, we can see our Xeon up here at 92 points. This is definitely taking the lead. It is a little bit ahead of the Core 2 E8400 at 87 points. So not mind-blowingly different, but it is certainly chart-topping. Moving over to Blender, we see 836 seconds. So this is now the leader of our Blender tests, is beating out the Core 2 Duo E8400 by a pretty good bit. That's about a minute faster than the Core 2 could produce these. Checking out CPU Z's benchmark, once again, it does not play well with AMD CPUs. That's why this CPU test is not used in the overall benchmarks. But since we were tracking, we might as well just continue it throughout the rest of the tests. Anyway, we are chart topping at 256.8 points in comparison to 243.9 on the Core 2 E8400 Wolfdale Core, which is the same thing as Penryn, just there's only two cores instead of four. Now moving on to the IDA64 integer benchmark, the Queen benchmark, we actually see the Wolfdale CPU coming ahead at uh, 6,387 points in comparison to 6,212. Now, this is obviously still faster than Conroe, but it is not as fast as the E8400, and I found that very, very surprising. However, FP32 performance, especially in our favorite thing in the world right now, ray tracing, we see we get 336K rays. I know we're talking about giga rays and GPUs, but... K rays on CPUs, that's that's good. But anyway, this is definitely chart topping as it beats out the Wolfdale CPU uh, from 294. So that's a pretty significant jump right there. Now this chart's starting to get a little bit crowded and I may have to do something with this in the future to make this a little bit easier to see. So I do apologize. But if we take a look at the latencies here in comparison, we actually see the L1 cache move up to 1.4 nanoseconds from the one nanosecond on the Core 2 Duo. However, L2 cache is significantly lower at three and a half nanoseconds, down from six and a half. And then we obviously don't have L3 cache on this CPU, but in comparison at 15.9 nanoseconds, it's significantly faster than either the Phenom 2 or the Phenom 1. Now, this is the first time we have an integrated memory controller on an Intel CPU during our IPC tests. At 59.7 nanoseconds, this only comes in second place to the Athlon 64 6000 Plus. This is the only CPU that has better memory latency than the brand new core architecture. So for their first time out, they're already tying the best that AMD ever had. All right, time to take a look at some overall benchmarks. Starting at the bottom as the baseline, the Pentium D830 at 100%. We can see the new core series is all the way up at 261.04%. And this is over the 247.35 on the E8400, which was the previous chart topper. Now switching over to the 6000 plus as the baseline, we see 144.15%. So 44% faster than the Athlon 64. And in comparison to the 136 0.66. So this was 36% faster than the Athlon 64. Now we are at 44% faster. And of course, the most interesting of all of these overall benchmarks, using the E8400, our previous champion, as the baseline. We can see that the brand new core series does deliver about 5.5% more performance overall, core for core, clock for clock. Now, I found that overall picture to be pretty interesting. And you can see in the benchmarks that the Core Series was better. Of course it was. But it wasn't that much better. Anantec really hit the nail on the head, as obviously the new Core first generation is not that much faster than the old Penryn and Wolfdale CPUs from the previous Core 2 generation. So why is it that we all remember that this first generation Core Series was such a big deal? 
I don't really understand. Uh, I like in my mind, I just remember back to that time that if you weren't running a Core i7, uh, like a 920 or better, you were basically just running crap. And, you know, that's probably due to a lot of marketing and stuff out there. And that's just the way that I remember history. But realistically, the speeds aren't that much better. The big thing was is the clock speeds on the Core series could go a lot higher. Four gigahertz was pretty normal and you could actually go beyond four gigahertz. So I think that's really where the performance came from is the much higher and easier to overclock CPUs. You add on that extra speed plus the extra 5% and that's the reason why the Core series dominated the Core 2 series. Just weird saying it in this context because you have the Core beating out the Core 2. I really wish they changed the name a little bit. But anyway, I find that pretty darn interesting there. And the next test, I think, is when we're really going to start seeing things just ramp up. And that's because next time we're going to be taking a look at Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge. Now, Sandy Bridge came out before the Bulldozer FX Series CPU. So that's the reason why Sandy Bridge is going to be next. And we might as well just do Ivy Bridge at the same time while we're doing that. After that, we will be taking a look at both Bulldozer and Piledriver in the following IPC test video and see exactly how the AMD FX CPUs really stack up against all the other CPU generations that came before it. I know that's going to be a big one. I know a lot of you guys are interested. I'm really interested to see how much better Sandy Bridge really is. I think we don't give that CPU enough credit. I mean, it gets a lot of credit. But I don't think it gets enough credit. But we will see in the next video. And if you guys really like testing like this, please consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. Links will be in the description below. This is how I get this stuff on hands. And obviously, as we're moving into more expensive parts, I'm going to need more stuff. You can also go ahead and reach me on Discord and donate any old parts you may have laying around. Over here on Patreon, I do have a list of all the parts that I need, and I will go ahead and keep this up to date and thank everybody who has either donated or has contributed to me getting these parts on hand. So go ahead and let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. Was this what you were expecting? Wasn't what I was expecting, but I want to hear your thoughts on this performance revelation. It's a revelation to me. I don't know how you feel, but that's why I'm asking. Go ahead and let me know. And if you like this video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Please share with friends. That really helps me out. And that's all I have for today. And I will catch you guys in the next video.